what's really striking about uh, what you said is how well positioned public libraries actually are. And it's great to have the public library perspective at something like this, but also how much that uh, they're already doing uh, and how much they're already doing that can be uh, kind of embraced in the ethos of, of open scholarship and open access. So that's, that's, that's great. Thank you so much for that. Uh, and thank you to all, uh, each of our panelists, uh, uh, five incredibly rich and uh, stimulating uh, presentations. Um, we do have a couple of questions in the, uh, coming through in the chat that I would like uh, to ask people the panelists to uh, reflect upon. Some of it has been touched, uh, touched on already. Um, and it, it, in some ways, it comes through each of, of the presentations. But the question from Lisa Lambert about what um, our panelists think are the impediments to uh, open scholarship it was a question that came through quite early. And it is something that comes up again and again. Um, and I suppose one way of looking at that is to think about uh, impediments to uh, adoption of open scholarship and also persuading the people who who would be involved in creating content uh, uh, to do so and to share it. Would anyone like to kick us off? Yeah, Justin, I, I think that's a really interesting question and I don't think there's a simple answer to it really. So I'm delighted to hear um, other people's ideas on it. But I think John touched there on the role of libraries as trusted organisations, you know, and I do think with openness, there's still a sense of people not maybe trusting it, I think, because it's free. You know, you always, I guess, value things that you pay for a little bit more than things you get for free. And that makes people a little bit suspicious I think around around openness sometimes like if an article or a book is free it's not as good as you know something something that you pay for and I think that's actually quite a contradiction really because the whole idea with openness and open research is it's more transparent it's you know um, evaluated under greater scrutiny it's the processes and how it's created are are opened up so it actually leads to better quality research in that sense so I think libraries and funders and you know university presses and institutions can really step in to kind of send that message to people that openness can be trusted and valued and is, is even better quality than let's say stuff behind a paywall you know in real terms but that challenge is a real cultural piece and i think and it's a it's a real mindset change for people and um, so i think our communication around this has to be has to be really good and and using our our trusted brand of libraries to endorse kind of openness and, and ensure that people trust it as well i think That's probably Michelle, could... yeah, that brings us back to the cultural change uh, aspect. It seems a, a theme that I think runs through this again and again. Sorry, David, you were going to come yeah, in. Sorry, Justin. Yeah, a couple of things following up from Mish. Um, there's the, the, the free, it's no good aspect, and people involved in creating open scholarship don't have big marketing budgets. We can't sell and promote in the way that commercial publishers can. Um, there's kind of general awareness of open scholarship, I mean, an event not like today, lots of people in the parliament saying, hoping to find out about it. People just aren't aware of initiatives or things going on. One thing which hasn't been mentioned today is open source software, another example of open scholarship. And um, previous job in Dublin Business School, um, fortunate to work with a couple of great managers who encouraged the use of um, open source and you know, there, there weren't many people using open source software and libraries. Um, just yeah, just general apprehension and um, fear of the unknown. And something I've found in in FET is that I've talked to people who have created resources. Do you want to share them? You know, no, I, I don't think they're good enough. Now again, it's kind of you you create these things, but you're 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 scared to share. You're scared to take the step into the unknown. And again, agreeing with Mish, that's where libraries can come in, trusted advisors and everything. We can help uplift material. We can promote, we can advocate, champion and lead. Slow process, but, you know, it's, you know, how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time? You just <laughs> got to keep on, keep, just make a start and keep on doing things. Sure. Thanks for that, David. Uh, anyone else want to come in on, on that question? Yeah, I think just in broad terms, Justin, 
the answer. It, it's a wicked problem. You know, this is a massive problem. But in broad terms, librarians are very good at collaborating with each other, at working, in, with, you know, through partnerships with each other. So that's one of the key fundamental enablers um, to open scholarship. And even having this conversation here today is a really good start. There's fantastic work going on in lots of different library communities. And NORF, I suppose, is the national voice of that. But it's important news and we don't reinvent the wheel. You know, my point there about the, there's so much research out there and it's, you know, getting it into practice or getting people to know about what um, um, you were saying there about we don't have those marketing and promotional budgets. So awareness and communication and education and partnership, like they are the key enablers. Sorry, I can't remember the question now. I think the question was what were the barriers? Um, sure, yeah. yeah the the, but the barriers are kind of the, the opposite to those. So the barriers are like, you know, lack of education. People, some mm. Do we all know what we're talking about? Do we have a good definition of open access, open science, open research, open scholarship? I mean, there's loads of definitions. Can we start there um, uh, and share all our definitions so we're all talking about the same thing or explaining the same thing? Uh, I'm not even sure I, I know some of those definitions. So, you know, we're, you know, there's novices and there's experts here. Um, but yeah, that was just... Uh, that uh, that is a really good point. It, it, it is, uh, and that's one of the things that we've attempted to do today. Is to sort of uh, to, to get to grips with the various ways that uh, uh, open scholarship itself is understood uh, as a concept. Uh, to go back to, to what you were saying as well in your original presentation, Eva, just the whole importance of education and literacy. We could talk about uh, open scholarship on on the one hand, but without. Uh, Marrying that to education and literacy and, and equality in that respect is uh, uh, another challenge again. Yeah, so thanks for that. Uh, anyone else want to come in on the question of um, impediments? Can I, can I just uh, come in, if I may, uh, Rhoda here? Um, I would just like to, uh, I suppose, in a, a, rather than the Im impediments, it's I, I come from the open data um, uh, side. We see libraries as being uniquely positioned um, for the engagement with the members of the public and for the education and, and you know, for the broader uh, dissemination of information to the to general public. And they're uniquely positioned because rather than a commercial company has to go out and advertise and get people to come into their store, people come in willingly to libraries looking for information. And it, I think that's a, a resource, um, you're, you know, you're very uniquely positioned, I think, um, and you also have a very good um, rapport on people, um, you know, they, they think of libraries in a very positive light as a place where they can go and get information. And I think that's a side of the libraries that needs to be utilised and, and you can use to your advantage an awful lot, you know, and I'm sure you obviously do this huge and, and very important um, engagement uh, being conducted through the libraries. I think that's that's a really positive um, avenue to, to utilise. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think, John, you would, you would agree with that. Um, I suppose the, the biggest thing that struck me about um, open scholarship and the terms used and everything else is, and I know it, it's, it's kind of been hit on a few times, but it, it is the literacy awareness and the, people being able to actually understand in plain English what, what everything means. And it's it was the biggest challenge for me in the last couple of weeks to try and understand what open scholarship is and open data is. Um, there's so many, I suppose, abbreviations. And for an ordinary person, um, you know, trying to get your head around the terminology before you can even understand what open data and open scholarship is. Um, can be a bit of an impediment. Um, but look, I think the, the likes of this morning, um, you know, I've learned so much this morning already. And, and I think if we could have more of these kind of events that make it uh, open access and open scholarship uh, available in kind of real terms and in practical terms for people so they can see how it's useful for them um, would be important. Yeah. A brilliant point, John. And actually, that chimes with uh, uh, a couple of the comments that are coming through in the chat. Um, 
uh, from Mark. To make data or information more open, should we be careful with the use of acronyms? There are a lot thrown around this morning. Uh, some I knew, but some I didn't. Uh, that's true of me as well, by the way. Uh, what is IRO, for example? Um, yeah, this point about plain English is very important. We could probably um, I APCs and issues like that. I think that they can become mystifying if if uh, what who wants to say what IRO is? I have no idea. <laughs> so the point is, 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 is so, so the QED then, to use another acronym, um, uh, as a point as well made, but I think it is an important point because we are actually, uh, in many ways, we're grappling with a lot of, of, uh, of different, uh, we're still making our way in, in terms uh, of what the reach of Open Scholarship is, the various ways that it can be applied. So I think it is important to, to, to use as, as, as plain language um, as possible. Um, just to, to uh, uh, a very important comment from uh, Neve. This is about exploitative publishers, which I think is another thing that was touched on a couple of times. Um, these publishers are exploiting the open access initiative to move in on inexperienced authors who are no longer able to publish in the uh, the uh, uh, in traditional high impact journals. One result is that some are beginning to confuse. Uh, open access with predatory publishing, uh, and and the value of it is being lost. I think that's uh, that's something that has sort of uh, come up a couple of times, and um, it's an important. Uh, I don't know if you wanted to come in again on that, Eva, but uh, it, it's something that is um, it's, it's certainly a barrier and an impediment to some sort of. Uh, 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 Open access risk. It's, it's a pretty serious. It's a it's a really um, serious topic. You know. There's a couple. Of, there's good advice coming through there about uh, uh, a glossary. That is something that we have started uh, doing actually in, in the Open Scholarship Group. But it's something that is definitely. Uh, this discussion has actually given rise to many other uh, uh, issues and, and aspects of terminology that can help to uh, enrich that. Um, Marta, is it a good time to um, look at the Padlets, do you think? Yes, it is. And if you want, I can share my screen so you can all see what's going on. Great. Uh, let me have a look at this. So we have two Padlets. The first one, we asked you a question um, when you registered. What does open scholarship mean to you? And these are some of the things that are coming up. Uh, the links are on the chat, so you can all just open it, the tabs if you want. Um, but really interesting things there. Uh, somebody says, a chance for the academic community to reclaim control of their out output from the publishing middlemen. Uh, somebody else says, I have little knowledge of open scholarship and, and would love to learn more. Who is it for? Can the general public use it? How does it compare to paid services? We hope this morning has actually answered some of those questions already. Uh, and a really interesting one here. I would love to see open scholarship used to challenge existing power structures, structures and inequities. What can be done to ensure open scholarship increases participation from those traditionally excluded from the narrative? How can open scholarship be leveraged to publish scholarship and research by underrepresented groups, etc.? So loads of uh, food for thought there. But basically, everyone seems to agree on the point of broader, easier, and more diverse access to scholarship in a variety of formats uh, from an, a variety of sectors, etc. Okay, and I'm going to share my the other Padlet, which is the one that's, that asked you what you hope to take away from today's event. And a lot of people just saying, ways to promote open scholarship, ways to understand open scholarship. Um, and we're hoping that this morning has served to kind of 
kick this off and uh, give people a handle on, on what open scholarship is. And also, of course, this is a newly established group within the Library Association of Ireland, and we will be running other events around open scholarship. So give us ideas about what you need to hear about and we can start planning. Yeah, there's, there's um, lots of ideas there about how to, uh, to promote OERs in, in individuals' own library, how, to, how people go about promoting uh, open scholarship within their own uh, institutions. I think that's, uh, uh, that's um, a very uh, important aspect of the discussion. Um, Justin, Leave. I'm going to stop sharing for a minute because Anya has raised her hand. Anya, are you somewhere there? Oh, yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> Hi there. Thanks a million, Marta. I wasn't sure if that's okay to do. Sorry. I'm yeah, absolutely. No, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Great. Thanks a million. Just, want, so, um, just for those who don't know me, um, I'm Anya Carey and I'm the Teaching and Research Development Librarian, so I look after the teaching team in Maynooth University. And one thing I just slightly, to, I'm involved in a couple of open access initiatives myself, including a European project on this. And I think generally looking at the Padlets, the reason I put up my hand was the kind of narrative tends to be correctly in many cases that obviously open access is a really powerful um, approach for change, whether that is in the way that we manage publishing agreements, opening up and being transformative in what we do in, say, I'm speaking from an academic perspective, but it's true across other sectors and, you know, increasing equity. Um, and that last comment you read out, Martha, really takes that on board. I agree with all of this fundamentally. One thing I think isn't picked up enough is how, particularly in academia, um, open access, it's transformative, but it is... Um, they're not so much problematic, but we need to be looking at the wider context. I mean, it is still the case for academics and for some of us, I think we'll know it as well. There's still that from a promotional prospect for visibility, for getting research funding, for progressing in their career, they need to be seen to be published in what we would traditionally have talked about as peer reviewed journals. That's not going anywhere quickly. And I know there's a lot of really interesting discussions going around, but it needs to be really brought to the fore at the top of university structures so that academics feel that it's meaningful for them in terms of their career progression, in terms of their access to funding. So I think one of the things we've done, it's a little bit of a hobby horse for me. The second point I want to make is that we talk about publishers a lot in these open forums, and I know obviously it's more nuanced in the actual negotiation that happens. We talk about publishers being bad, being predatory, being opportunity, you know, essentially taking content. I think it's important to realize that there is a role for publishers, and obviously some of the agreements take that into consideration. Publishers very often provide a way for our newer people who are coming into contact with academic information to discover it, to filter it, to mediate it and to manage it. So I think it's unfair to argue that publishers per se don't have a role in the presentation and the making available of academic content, but clearly without doubt, how things have got to is unsustainable. It's not accepted at governmental level, at university level. We can't have that power imbalance going. But I think that I have seen some open access resources which are not possible for students to navigate, which go against information literacy principles, which will be fine if you are someone already with a ready developed skill set of how to search effectively, of understanding the key search terms, of knowing how to filter and self-discover and explore. But just remember that our students coming in as first years, not just as first years, but all the way up and into postgraduates, don't always have the successful IL skills that would enable this. And there can be a role for successfully produced um, content and that comes at a cost. So I do, I suppose, want to encourage us not to become too um, binary in that open access is intrinsically good and there is a problem with paid for content. And obviously the deals that are available under the different levels of gold, green access and so on, take account of that. So I know I'm simplifying it a little bit, but in today's narrative, I didn't hear enough of that being brought to brought to bear. And I suppose something that with the project, one of the projects I'm involved on is looking, if we're moving to an, an opportunity for open access and open pedagogy, how does that affect how we teach our students to become 
information literate. And I think it's a really exciting time for those of us involved in teaching in the area of information literacy. Um, many of you might have um, heard Alan speaking recently at was it last week? The weeks are running in. Really interesting, challenging our concepts around all of this. So just to say, I think in the way in which we interrogate and consider information and bring our students to understand that needs to happen in tandem with when we start talking about open access. So sorry, I threw a lot of stuff out there. I just wanted to kind of get it out there to the wider audience. Thank you so Thank much you. for that, Anya. That's a really, really important point. It, it, it can become a comfort of sorts to think in terms of comfortable, comfortable binaries. And I think it is useful to challenge that, especially when what we are uh, also fundamentally talking about is, as you say, information literacy and how, uh, how to enhance that and how um, we can uh, promote information literacy across the board, which is, of course, what uh, librarians are um, really all about. It has come up uh, a few times in, in our panellists' uh, initial addresses, but I, I suppose I want to just re revisit that briefly from the panel for some thoughts on what, uh, what more librarians can actually be doing that maybe they aren't already doing, taking everything that everyone has said uh, on board, if anyone wants to uh, come in. Well, I guess just to, to touch on some of the things maybe Anya said there, um, I completely agree with a lot of what you said there, Anya, in terms of, um, you know, conflating open access with quality or excellence automatically, you know. Um, and I think it's important that we we don't kind of um, do that. Um, you know, you can have a really high quality, excellent piece of research that just happens to be paywalled, you know, that doesn't make it less good than an open access article, for example, that just happens to be open, but is, you know, maybe less quality or less impactful research in other ways. So I think we do need to be careful about falling into this, you know, everything open is fantastic and everything paywalled or behind a barrier is terrible. You know, it's that, it's that nuanced view and I know myself, I'm always keen to um, kind of, I guess, articulate openness as a spectrum or a continuum. And it's about, you know, openness by degrees and moving towards more openness in a way that's meaningful for you in your context or your discipline as a researcher. Uh, I always believe in meeting people where they're at themselves rather than where you want them to be, you know. So I think moving people towards more openness, even in small ways, can just be really beneficial. So you don't have to make your entire reading list open access material, but, you know, incorporating some level of openness uh, in, in how you teach or how you research, I think, is, is always a good thing and moving towards that, that in a kind of stepwise way. And I think again, librarians can sometimes be a little bit, everything has to be open now straight away and wouldn't it be great? Um, but I myself tend to take a bit more of a realistic view and kind of move people along slowly. And I think that's maybe a messaging piece that we can we can work on to, as well as just, you know, selling the, the importance of openness as a, as a whole and full, fully open uh, research practices. Thanks, Michelle. Yeah, it, it is a, an incremental uh, process really. And that's, uh... Uh, what we're attempting to do today is, is kind of take the measure of where that is uh, uh, and, and respect of where we're going. So thanks for that. Uh, just a comment from Isabel, uh, perhaps an info lit module on open access literacy should be offered uh, to all students. I mean, that's a really important point about how that can be factored into, well, perhaps assessment, but also just generally uh, uh, um, be made part of, uh, of the, the academic program. Um, and that in turn, the practices of that can then be applied further afield in public libraries and so on. If um, I can, Justin. Yeah, um, David. A couple, of, a couple of points. Um, Isabel mentioned the uh, InfoLit module. I think uh, Isabel also teaches on the uh, MSc in Library Information Management at DBS, and they have an open scholarship module, which I helped develop with my own trumpet. But um, which is very good for um, educating potential librarians about the benefits and challenges of open. And I think that other um, LIS courses should incorporate teaching of open on their courses. Um, go back to the open access, but yeah, open by degree. And um, also there's a um, big growth area in libraries at the moment library publishing. Somebody um, mentioned earlier, I used the phrase trusted partners. 
libraries can get involved in um, publishing initiatives, um, create their own journals, um, do some of the heavy lifting in terms of getting peer review or proofing of articles, submit submissions. So there's lots li libraries and librarians can do, but I think um, it's important that open scholarship becomes part of library school curricula going forward. Right. Thanks, David. Uh, I just want to bring in another question from uh, the floor from AJ, uh, who has his hand up. AJ Linan. Hi, uh, just in connection with uh, that there's big money involved um, with, I remember over 10 years ago, there was a big hoo-ha when uh, Elsevier made over a billion in uh, profit. And I'm just after looking at the bookseller there for 2019, the most recent profits. And in that year, the revenue went up 4% and profits up 3%. So they're near one and a half billion dollars. And that is made up of over 2 million articles submitted and 1 billion articles consumed by researchers. So maybe uh, librarians are too nice or the governments are too nice. One and a half billion isn't a, a bad little return. And just to remember that. So uh, the last time, and with all the open access talk over the last 10 years or whatever, their profits are increasing steadily. And their revenues, is, as I said, up 4%. It seems to be that each year. And the profits of 3%. But journal inflation is, seems to be running at over 10%. So how you can marry that. Just as a, another aside, a quarter of that uh, one, it's a billion sterling at the moment. But a quarter of that profit is from Europe. So uh, you'd be glad to know that you've helped pay for... Uh, a quarter of that, one and a half billion. So I just want to make that maybe governments are too nice. And uh, they, uh, one of the big departments they have at Severe of their divisions, and all four divisions made profits uh, at the most recent profit uh, listing, is their legal department. So um, just to put that in context, that that's going on in the background. Uh, so Elsevier and the boys are still having fun. So just to make that point. Thanks for that, AJ. Um, does anyone else want to come in from the panel on this question of? If not, I just want to, because we're getting close to the end now. Um, one thing I would like to do is just to, um, from Hardy, uh, and also to, to flag up the NUI Goalways um, Open Scholarship uh, Week next month, I would like to mention our Open Scholarship Community Grassroots Group in Galway. We are a group of enthusiasts who try to create a learning and sharing community that emphasizes the benefits of openness and, uh, to researchers and general public. We are modeled on uh, uh, OSCs in the Netherlands and the network is growing. So um, uh, the link for the group is there. What I'll also do is I'll just share the link for uh, the week itself. Uh, it'll certainly be of interest to everybody who has attended today. So I'll just share that in the chat. Then what I would like to do is probably just to come back to the panel for a brief sort of final thoughts, really, because we, we've got to that stage already. Um, we I hope we've managed to get everyone in and get uh, and get everyone's, uh, the audience's thoughts as much as possible. Um, Apologies if I've missed anyone. Um, as uh, Brida has said, the, the uh, Padlets will remain open, so please continue to contribute uh, to them. Um, how to phrase the final question, I guess, is if you had to speculate on how open scholarship might develop over the next 10 years, uh, if anyone has any thoughts. based on everything that we've heard today and, and some of the issues that have arisen in terms of the challenges and in terms of where we might be. I think if I may, from a, from a public library point of view, I think that as a sector, we have uh, a responsibility to upskill ourselves a bit in terms of um, open access and open scholarship and to kind of actively take part in it. 
Um, I think we, we're so busy doing what we do and um, I suppose we listen to our customers. So any anything we might do from an, an open data or open scholarship point of view should be in response to, to the needs of the, the public, um, which will be different than from an academic environment. But uh, I think if we if we if we learn a lot, if we become involved, if we collaborate with with other organizations and agencies, if we look to um, like Rhoda had there with the, the national element and the national information and try and feed into and out of that as well, I think we'd be doing we'd be doing all right. Brilliant. Thanks, John. Anyone else want to come in? Just as a general prin principle, and I agree with what John has said, I think the idea of co-creation is important so that even if we did put together a wiki around open science and all those concepts, or if we have, if, if this group have events in the future, it would be an idea, maybe a radical idea to involve non-librarians. Okay, we're very good at talking to ourselves and preaching to the converted. One of the things I've learned from working in the health service is that patient involvement and patient empowerment, unless they're sitting at the same table, that's how you get the conversation and the real impact going. So similarly with librarians, everyone, we're all trying to do good things. And we, we're a very good community in Ireland are working together. But if we could bring other groups into that, that conversation, I think that would actually really be beneficial for everyone. Just a suggestion. And yeah, no, thanks for that, Aoife. And it is, uh, it's, it's part of the explicit aims of this group to, to reach from libraries to wider uh, society. So thank you so much. Uh, for that, um, for that point. Um, anyone else want to come in? Justin, can I just make one other point as well? Um, Aoife just reminded me there with her point. It's really important. I agree completely with her. And just to say that in the area of co-creation, um, another, and again, I know I'm speaking from an academic perspective and it's wider than that, but just from my own perspective, there's a lot of conversation. One of the nice, um, outcomes from this really difficult time has been really identifying students um, more actively as being co-creators as part of their educational programs. Um, they got much more of an opportunity in the past year to, I suppose, you know, really decide how programs would be um, presented and how they might input into them and how they might work together. And even they were able to, in some cases, influence assessment. And I think that's been positive. And I think this area of open access and how they might because ultimately we want them to benefit from this and how they could both utilize open access as a way to share what they do and what they uh, they themselves as co-creators and how open access material can be um usefully presented to them um so a kind of a resource a, a team of people who are very effective at speaking in all of this area and many people knows the the edtl um iua DigEd project that sharon flynn leads and the edtl project that she is leading has a series of edtl interns of so some in all of the universities which you'll know about um the iua DigEd seminars run every monday lunch or nearly every monday lunchtime and they're often led by the edtl students and their insights into how we might deliver content effectively are really, really useful. So if you haven't attended any of those, just have, I know chat isn't there anymore to put the link in, but you can just Google, Google it and you'll get all of the seminars are available on the EDTL blog. So just to share that. That's brilliant. Uh, Anya, thanks very much. Uh, um, our time is more or less up. So um, if I could just uh, ask everybody to give a little reaction to our excellent panel for uh, today's discussion please, a little um, applause hand. Um, thank you to uh, uh, to our panel. Um, this has been our, uh, a really interesting inaugural event for the Open Scholarship Group. Um, please stay in touch. Uh, we, we, we'll uh, keep you abreast of what we're doing uh, in future. Uh, thank you for all the contributions in the chat and the questions and the links. They've been really important. Uh, this is a conversation that will continue and a discussion that will go on beyond this. And the whole point of today was to get, uh, as you say, to, to, to get that uh, conversation going. So thanks to the panel and thank you to everybody for coming.
Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you Justin. Everyone. Thanks very much. Thank very good. Very interesting. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Amazing first event. Thanks, everyone. Especially the chat. Wow, <laughs> the chat what an event. <laughs> Thank you so much. What an event. So impressive. Thank Thanks you very much. Brilliant, brilliant Thanks, event. Everybody. Well done, everyone. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.